Hello, my lovely anatomist and physiologist, Michelle Glass here. We are ready to investigate the anatomy of a typical male body type. And of course, we're using the term male here based on our definition of biological sex. And we're looking at photographs of models from our lab and we have one model where we see more intact structures and we have the other model where we're able to see a sagittal cut through the pelvic cavity. And so let's begin by looking at the tissue called the scrotum. So the scrotum we see is made of skin and adipose tissue and muscle. And it's actually helping to hold the testis outside of the pelvic cavity. So it's gonna hold the testes outside pelvic cavity um, to reduce um, temperature. So we'll see that sperm production, sperm need, a temperature that's like two to four degrees Celsius below internal body temperature. And so if we take a look at our sagittal cut of the scrotum here, and this is the cut of the testis in the middle, you can see red line immediately surrounding the testis here. And so this is in part representing there are two muscles that are helping to elevate the scrotum. So we have what's called the dartus muscle and we have what's called the cremaster muscle, which actually will help elevate the testes. So if it is cold, we want to bring the testes closer to the warmth of the pelvic cavity. If it is hot out, we want to relax those muscles to allow the testes to be at a cooler temperature. So we will see that this change is happening. This holding of this temperature is so significant, it can affect the fertility of the male. Very often it's a reversible, just wear looser pants, stay out of the hot tub, and you should see a, um, an increase in healthy sperm production. We're seeing that the scrotum is holding the gonad here, which is the testis. That's the singular version of the word testes for plural. And we're gonna come back and talk about the cells that are making up the testis um, or testes. And we'll talk about the production of sperm, which is happening there as well. So when we talk about the testes, we'll just say, this is our location of what's called spermatogenesis. So we'll come back to that conversation in a later video. We see actually sort of like sitting on top of the testis an enlarged tissue called the epididymis. Checking my spelling here. The epididymis has kind of two important jobs. So this is going to be where sperm are really going to finish their maturation process. It's going to hold, um, it's gonna hold sperm for about 12 days to complete this maturation process. And then we'll see that, um, so it can just be like a storage of sperm until ejaculation occurs. And then we'll see at ejaculation, um, actually I should say at emission, sperm are moved by smooth muscle contractions. So this structure called the epididymis is important in the process of finishing the maturation of sperm. It's important in stirring the sperm until emission occurs, which is the step right before ejaculation. And we'll see that there will be smooth muscle contractions in the epididymis that will transport that sperm into the next passageway, which has a couple of names. This is here 
what's called the vas deferens, or it can be called the um, ductus deferens. And notice that this vessel or um, tube is extending into the scrotal sac. So this is outside of the pelvic cavity and then it's transporting the sperm into the pelvic cavity. So if you've heard of a vasectomy before, that's where the physician can come in and clip, cut, and cauterize this tubing, preventing the ejaculate from having sperm as part of the ejaculate. So that would be what's happening in the vasectomy. Now, while this can be reversed, um, physicians like to consider this a permanent birth control solution. So this is something you want to think about as being permanent. Now, we will see that in this vessel, we do have smooth muscle. So we will see peristaltic waves propelling the sperm here. When we go ahead and look at our sagittal cut, We see that the vas deferens is feeding into what we can call the ejaculatory duct. And the ejaculatory duct we're going to see will feed into the urethra. So we mentioned in the urinary system that in male bodies, we're going to have a combined urinary reproductive passageway, which is called the urethra. And we can name the different parts of the urethra. So we're going to see this gland surrounding the urethra. Okay, I had a little technical difficulty. So hopefully we're back together here, looking at the sagittal cut of the pelvic cavity. And we can see at the base of the bladder surrounding the urethra, the gland that's called the prostate. Prostate. And so that portion of the urethra that passes through the prostate is called the prostatic. Urethra. Now, I believe I mentioned when we were talking about the homologous structures that the prostatic urethra or the prostate gland, one of the things that it's going to do is swell around the urethra, preventing urine, urination from happening during uh, sexual intercourse. The prostatic urethra then moves into what's called the membranous urethra. And then as we get into the penis, we'll see the urethra is going to be called the spongy urethra. Now the spongy urethra is named because it's located inside an erectile tissue called the spongy um, corpus spongiosum. And then you have, so that is one sort of layer of erectile tissue and their urethra is running through that erectile tissue. But then you have two sitting on top, which are called the corporis cavernosum. And so these are the, the erectile tissues that are running through the penis. These are running through the penis. So the penis then is the external genitalia. And the penis is gonna have four jobs. So the penis has four jobs. So one of its job is sensation. One of its job is penetration. 
one of its job is ejaculation. And the last job would be urination, because remember the urethra is part of the reproductive system. So when you look at some of the differences in how the uh, male body type genitalia is oriented versus how the female body type genitalia is oriented, you know, it, it's in large part because we do see different jobs here. On this model, we'll see on either side of the urethra, underneath the prostate, another set of glands um, that we can call Cowper's glands or bulbo-urethral glands. And we'll talk about the job of the prostate gland and the Cowper's gland here in just a minute. And we'll fully trace the pathway of sperm through this track. If we take a look at this other model, we see, of course, the entire penis. We see this very smooth tip to the penis, which is called the glands penis. And then we have a layer of tissue covering over top to protect this very sensitive tissue. And that is called the foreskin. That's called the foreskin or the prepus. The prepus or foreskin is uh, removed during infancy by a lot of parents. This is removed for religious reasons. This is part of that contract. If you're Jewish, um, you'll see that that occurs as a whole religious ceremony. Um, if you're not Jewish, but you're in socialized in the Western world, more than likely you've had a circumcision performed on you as an infant. Um, removal of foreskin. So this is not something that has any um, necessity. Um, there's no scientific reason to have the foreskin removed for most, most individuals. Again, you know, the, the key issue is like, if it causes pain, if your genitals are experiencing pain, then you need to seek out um, some help. Taking a look at this model where we see the reproductive structures a little bit more intact, we can see at the base, here's the bladder. We can see at the base of the bladder, the prostate gland. And then we can also more easily see here the seminal vesicles, which we couldn't see on the previous diagram at all. Okay, so when we talk about the glands of the male reproductive tract, we're gonna have the prostate gland, we're going to have the seminal vesicles, and we're going to have the, I'm going to list it here, bulbo-urethral gland or Cowper's gland. When we talk about the prostate, we said, you know, one of the important jobs is to surround and swell around the urethra, helping to sort of cut off movement of urine. It's making it difficult to urinate. It's going to excrete a very alkaline, milky fluid that's going to become part of the ejaculate or the semen. And it's going to help um, coagulate the sperm. 
making it easier to get that sperm package into the female reproductive tract. So it's helping to keep it together. And then it's going to decoagulate the sperm. Once those sperm are safely inside the female reproductive tract, then you want to separate them so they're no longer a clump so they can more easily move through, so they can more easily move through the female reproductive tract. We'll see that the prostate gland does become enlarged at puberty and again at age 25. And we see um, as people are getting into their 60s, about 40% have an enlarged prostate that might be causing a little bit of a problem for them for urinating. By the age of 80, we see about 80% of folks having an enlarged prostate having difficulty um, urinating. So that's a pretty common thing for um, individuals with male body types to deal with. When we talk about the seminal vesicle, we'll see that 60% of the semen volume is going to be coming from this particular gland. We'll see that this fluid is going to be very high in the sugar fructose, which is going to um, be used by the sperm to produce ATP to fuel their little flagella to help them as they swim through the female reproductive tract. And we'll see that the seminal vesicle is going to empty into what's called the ampulla of the vas deferens. So the vas deferens or ductus deferens, which is bringing the sperm into the pelvic cavity, has this enlarged chamber called the ampulla, and the seminal vesicle is going to empty directly into the vas deferens. Vas deferens then is going to empty into the ejaculatory duct. Um, excuse me, the prostate gland is also um, emptying into the ejaculatory duct. And then we also have, I feel like it's hard to see the different gland names, so I'm going to highlight those so it's more obvious. And then we have either the bulbo urethral gland or the Kelper's gland. So it has um, two different possible names. This gland is producing what people often refer to as the pre-ejaculate, meaning that this is going to wash through the urethra before most of those sperm do. It's a very thick and salty fluid. It's going to help like cleanse the urethra because remember this has had urine passing through which can be pretty acidic and so the sperm need to have more of an alkaline um, passageway. Um, it's also going to help lubricate both the um, urethra, making it easier for the sperm to move through, but also the vagina, which we'll see is the passageway um, into the female reproductive tract. And we'll see, it's important to note that even though the pre-ejaculate means before ejaculate, this can sometimes contain sperm. So some couples use what's described as the pullout method to um, prevent pregnancy. So engaging in intercourse and then before the male partner ejaculates, he withdraws uh, from the female um, with the hopes that the sperm are in the ejaculate and so pregnancy cannot occur. And that unfortunately is not true because sperm can be present there with that pre-ejaculate. So pregnancy can occur. Okay, so if we try to trace out the path of our sperm, there's still some structures that we haven't looked at together yet. So we're gonna save those for just a few minutes. So I'm gonna say, Let's start with the testes. We're going to move into the epididymis where we have maturation of sperm and storing of sperm. From there, the sperm move into the vas deferens, or you can call it the ductus deferens. From there, we see 
moving into what's called the ejaculatory duct. And from there, we see moving into the urethra where we have the prostate urethra or prostatic urethra. Then we have the membranous urethra. And then we have the spongy urethra, which is the urethra that's actually um, running through the erectile tissue called the corpus spongiosum. And from there, we have the exiting from the external urethral opening. All right, up next, let's take a closer look at that testy and talk about how sperm are produced. So we're gonna be going into that process of spermatogenesis. So stay tuned. As always, take care of yourselves and each other.